Okay, well, let's get started with this. Uh, uh, I'm going to start with this little diagram. This comes, this diagram is not in this book, but the, the material, the points are in this book. It's called Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands. It's one of the uh, recommended reads. And, and basically, it's, a, it's an expanded version of what you're getting today. Quite a bit of material for how the, the how-to of helping people. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm kind of excited about doing this topic because it, uh, pardon me a second, there's a personal reason for this because I've been in the position of either being helped or helping other people. And being in the position of being helped you, it's a well. If you're, any of you have done it, it's it's a little unnerving to to be in a position uh, grasping for straws, needing help, can't can't figure your way out, and then relying and just you you go to whoever. And most people are good-hearted, kind, want they want to help, but don't know how to help. So that's kind of the, the motivation for this whole seminar and then this topic is, is a piece of that. Uh, because to do it, you gotta start somewhere. So I wanna, I wanna just try to help you realize that this discussion of getting started, or starting well, starting what? What are we starting? So I, I think it's probably assumed that you know that this is about counseling. This is about helping people. But it's more than that. It's, it's the start of a relationship. And it could be a relationship that you haven't had before with this particular person. And I think one of the, one of the concerns David had was that we understand that the context of starting well is in the context of people helping people, but not necessarily in a counseling setting like this, people coming to deeper life. It's not necessarily for that. It's for at home. It's at church. And I think uh, the church is probably the better setting for getting help than a counseling center. But they're needed, and they have a place. But you could, this could be another topic, is why are counseling centers needed? Well, isn't it because there's some some expertise that is useful that isn't, we don't have at home. So let's tie this together with what's going on today is this is to give this information so you can take it back home and do this at home. This is, uh, this is okay to try this at home, okay? <laughs> like maybe you've seen some re advice and guy's gonna do some weird stuff and then don't try this at home, okay? But you can try this at home. So this diagram basically is a summary of four parts, four ingredients that go into helping people. It's not steps. These are, these are, these are simultaneous things that happen uh, in, in a helping and discipleship situation. We're not going to cover them all. Don't worry about trying to read the fine print on there. Uh, if somebody wanted a copy of this little diagram, I can print one for you. But the point is that the seminar is going to cover these four points, basically. But today, I want to talk a little bit about number one, called love, and a number, little bit about number two is knowing. Because that's how you get started, is, is if you're the helper, you need to, otherwise, it's, you need to love them. If you don't have a love for this person that you're sitting with, you're mechanical. You're, you're going through the motions, and you're establishing a, kind of a false relationship. Well, that, I, I've struggled with that a little bit because what if this is a stranger that I've, I really don't know? How do, how do I love that person? So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And I like to say that both those helping and those being helped, if you're in here, this, if you're in the room today, this should be good for both of you. <clears throat> so to love well, first of all, we need to look inward. We need to look at our own heart. 
We need to desire a relationship with someone. And we need to listen to them with purpose. So let's go through this. First of all, look at your own heart. This starts with really taking a close look at why am I doing this? Why am I sitting with this person? Is there pride or something pushing me forward to, to this? Uh, a good model for our, our motives is Jesus. Though he was God, he did not think it of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges he took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. That's kind of the essence of what we're trying to do. That, that's, that's the model of our humility that we need to, to think about. We need to guard ourselves against a condemning self righteous spirit because it's a temptation for humans to look at another human and if they're in a if they have a problem, to think better of ourselves because I don't have that problem. So I'm going to be gracious. I'm going to help that person. Now that's kind of a, a self-righteous position. It's, it's, and it's easy to have. It's, it's, it's something that really needs to be worked on. Maybe more than others. Um, for me, it's a big one. For you, it might be a small one. But it's still there. And we also need to think about Objectives. Uh, ben Ben nailed it with the objective of of uh, <clears throat> being more like Christ, establishing a relationship, restoring a relationship with Him, and that the the objective, the motive behind helping, is going to influence everything you do, even from starting, even how you start will be affected by the objective you really have with that person. What, what is your point? What, what are you trying to accomplish? And if, if you have the wrong worldview, and that's where all of this starts is a worldview, and I'm not going to go into that, but if you have a worldview that says this person is basically a glorified animal and there is no God, you're, you're going to approach that differently than if you recognize a person that, that is created in the image of God, and, and you're going you're gonna to realize that that person has a heart and things are affecting that person's heart, just like it affects our own hearts. So and we're, we're, all of us are in the sanctification process. If we, if we haven't been born again, like Ben mentioned, then you establish that relationship. If, you, if the person has, then you restore that relationship or enhance that relationship but we're all in that process, every one of us, whether we're helping or being helped, we're in the process of dealing with our carnal nature. We're help, trying to grasp what it means to have Christ as our identity. It's easy to say, it's easy to, it's easy to put on paper, but that's hard to, to remember that our identity is Jesus. What does that really mean? And I'm not going to go there today, but, but it's, it's a big factor, and if, if you need to sit down and think about that before you start with someone, I would recommend doing it. What is your identity? And what your identity is will influence how you approach that person. And so both of us, it says here, both of us should be experiencing daily repentance. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's essential for, for work, walking together. <clears throat> And another point is, uh, a person is a person, not a project. It's easy to think of, and, and, I, and I'm, I'm guilty of that. I'm, I'm a, my job, one of my jobs here at Deeper Life is to receive the first calls that people have, either, either helpers or those wanting help, and to talk with them and get the get a little understanding of the story and what, what. Uh, and what they're dealing with, and because they're calling here to try to get some help. It's easy to think of that person, it's a nameless person, and, and I get a name, but it's still a faceless person, person on the phone. This is, 
the, it's easy to think of them as a, like a project. Like, okay, I can I can tackle this. I can I can I can help s straighten this out. And but that's a wrong approach, because this is another human being that's experiencing life and and like like myself, like maybe all of you, there are ups and downs in life. And there are things that are really hard to deal with. And we reach out to someone to get help. We don't want to be thought of as a project. So 1 Thessalonians 2 says, as apostles of Christ, we had we certainly had a right to make some demands of you, but instead we were like children among you, or we were like a mother feeding, caring for her own children. We loved you so much that we shared with you not only God's good news, but our own lives too. That's kind of the example. Uh, it's being an example, it's hard to remember that in the midst of the helping situation. And it's also a temptation uh, to feel good about being needed. You know, if you have some skills that others can benefit from and they start coming to you, it's, it's a natural human thing to think, yeah, I, I've got the answer. I, I'm, I'm really, I'm ready. I, I can give that to them. And it, it can blow up to the point where, you know, there's a, there's a phrase called the Messiah complex where I'm going to save them from this problem. And that's disastrous to have that attitude. It'll show up eventually. So another point is to, to give div diligence to biblical meditation and personal prayer. Uh, important because if, if we don't have that connection, if we don't have that discipline, so to speak, of knowing scriptures and the practice of pouring out ourselves to God and knowing that he's listening and then praying for people and others. If that's not a practice, you can go back to being that mechanical uh, without love. Dealing with a problem, you may have, you still have the resources to deal with the problem, but if the heart is not there, to see that person as someone that's, that's hurting, uh, it has an effect on how you approach it. So we need to desire a relationship with this person. Ooh, that can be, that can be, that can be <laughs> awkward at times. Because a lot of times when people have problems, it makes them less attractive. It makes them less desirable. It, it makes them harder to relate to. So we need to develop that relationship and desire it which is a hard thing, and it may go back to needing to be on our knees a little more to ask God to help give us that, that, uh, that attitude, that heart for this person that may be kind of messy. So we need to model the compassion and respect that Jesus had for needy people. And it helps, I think, it, helps, it ha has helped me to be in that position of being the needy person. And hum it's, it's humbling. And it's, if you don't look at it right, it can be humiliating. It, it shouldn't be humiliating, it should be humbling. But if, if our heart isn't where it should be, it will be humiliating. And there's a difference between being humbled and being humiliated. <clears throat> because it means, to be humiliated means our heart is somewhere else, our identity is somewhere else, and it's, it's diminishing our value in our own minds. That shouldn't be the case. So there's some practical ways to develop this relationship. It depends on the circumstance. Uh, there's a couple things listed in your notes here. Go out for coffee, know their interests, have conversations anywhere. That's great, but sometimes a relationship, the, the, the opportunities you have may not afford that, Maybe may not make that available. Uh, but if you can, that's probably helpful. Because here in this, our situation, we don't really have that opportunity. That's not how our relationship develops. It's basically in the counseling office. But that's why I said, at church, at home, that's where it can go better. You, you can have those opportunities because you have a more long-term uh, connection with this person. So as you develop this relationship, 
<clears throat> Listen for certain phrases that you might hear in their story as they tell you this. Listen for emotional phrases. Uh, it's one thing to gather facts, and you need to gather facts, but listen for what's going on inside. And sometimes what's going on inside will come out maybe in a harsh way. Well, that's an emotion, so listen for the emotions. And perhaps reflect back to them what you've heard. Uh, every now and then say, I, th I think I'm hearing you say such and such. Is that what you mean to say that this and da 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 da? Uh, so then they can verify that and they can get a sense that you're listening and you're paying attention and not just waiting for them to quit to, so you can give your advice. So ask them if there's anything you want, uh, they want you to pray about. This can help them recognize that you're with it and, and you care. And it could be, sometimes it might be appropriate right there, right at that moment. Pray right there, just in the coffee shop or whatever, just where you have to be in the, in the office. That's not my nature, but the few times that I've done it has been uh, kind of rewarding. It's kind of, kind of interesting, the, re the reaction that happens in that type of situation. And then also I would, I would resist the temptation to try to identify with them by saying, oh, well, that's just like happened to me. And that story, well, here's what happened to me. And da, 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 you give, tell the story. Well, that's not the right time for that. There may be a time for that. But in the initial, this, we're talking about starting up. We're, we're an initial relationship <laughs> forming period here. So you start telling their, telling their story, you're putting them on hold and the focus is not on what they're dealing with, it's you. So you're not helping them in that, in that case. Or it may not be helping them in the way you think it is. I think what you're trying to do is help them see that you're not alone, somebody else has suffered from this too, and there's a time for that, but it, this probably isn't the best time. Listen, uh, listen carefully, listen with purpose. And keep in mind that they do life in two ways, two areas. There's inside of themselves and outside of themselves. And the outside is their circumstances, the, the things that they're facing, the problems that they have, the experiences that they've gone through. That's, that's their outside uh, situation and we all every one of us has them we we're all in we're, we're in a common one today we're all sitting here in this room that's part of it but the other parts is the problems each of you are facing are probably different so we need to recognize that with the person that we're helping that there's something going on with them and then inside refers to how are they dealing with it how are they thinking about it and how are they processing those circumstances, those problems and experiences? How are they interpreting it? And likely that's why they're sitting there talking to you because it's how they've interpreted it, how they've responded to that has led them maybe into a dead end and it's, it's not going well, causing problems. So that's key. This is your opportunity to listen carefully, try to dig in, try to, try to listen. I don't know how to say it, but don't just listen to the words in the situation. Listen to what's behind it, what's inside. Your first objective is to thoroughly know both of those areas, though, before speaking into those situations. And that's why I said, don't give, don't give your example first. Listen carefully, and it may take more than just this first meeting. And this topic is talking about the first meeting you have with someone. So keep that in mind. So that's what we want to, I don't want to say just eliminate these things, just wait on some of them. We also want to listen to where there are fear and anger and guilt and anxiety, hopelessness, all these different things. And I, and I mentioned listening for emotions. Well, this, that's, that's what's going to show up. 
It's, it's, if, they're, if they've gotten a little bit of comfort with you, then, then some of them will start coming out. That may be a little clue as to how comfortable they are. If they continue in your first meeting to be kind of closed and very surface, you haven't got there yet. Give them time. Uh, don't give up. But just don't get frustrated that, oh, they're not pouring out to me yet. Well, this is number one. You've just started. This could be the first 10 minutes. And, uh, so just be patient. But if it does start coming, listen carefully. Try to sort it out. You're, you're gathering information like a detective. And right now it's more information, but emotions are information. And look on their face. Look, look at them. See, see how it's, what it's doing to their body. Uh, and also you can pay attention to listening for how are they looking at themselves. How do they interpret themselves? What, what kind of verbiage are they using to, to portray their own value? Where they, how they think they're doing? How they think they are? How valuable they think they are? I mean, as a simple, simple example is, oh, I'm worthless. Nobody cares for me. Nobody likes me. And, and no, nobody invites me anywhere. Okay, you're, you're getting into some information. And where, where are they finding their identity? You're going to have to do a little bit of thinking about this. It may be, it, they may just not just say, my identity is, uh, they probably won't say that. But you can kind of gather from some things that they say and start getting some clues as to where that is. What are they, how do they express it and what brings them fulfillment? Uh, another thing, this is, this is just, this is not the only ones, but these are some ideas of start how to listen with purpose. And then finally, probably the most important is, how do they view God? What are they, what are they saying about God? How do, they, how do they put him in the picture? <clears throat> so you've just, those parts are just kind of the, some of the examples of expressing love to that person. This is, these are parts of uh, expressing that care for this person by this way. Now, you're going to see that they, those will easily fit in another category, like getting to know the person. So, in a sense, loving the person is part of getting to know the person. It's not like step one is love and next step two is get to know them. It, they go together. They're meshed together. You can't separate them. But if you don't have love for a person, you're not going to know them as well as if you do. So, some quick things to go through here that we're going to look at. Speak carefully. Look for ways to portray God. Be prepared for complications. Define roles. Talk about future meetings. Determine your goals. First of all, speaking carefully. Uh, talked on, touched on a little bit already. We tend to speak way too soon. Just like that sharing your own personal testimony. It, it comes too easy, comes too quickly. So that's where we, it, it's good to pray for help, for God to help us discern when's, when's a good time to start saying something. And for ideas of what, what to say uh, and what to do with things that we don't, don't really know yet. So it may be, the best thing is probably to start off silently. Now, I don't mean not saying anything to them. I mean, don't start giving any advice, giving direction in your own, but start, keep asking questions. So your speech at this point probably is more in the form of questions. <clears throat> and recognize that people can be gun shy from being previously mishandled. And that's, I, I can speak to that. Uh, if you've been slapped a few times where you didn't, where it didn't, it didn't seem to make sense, you're going to hesitate to share more with another person again. And how do I know I'm not going to get slammed again and, and rebuked or whatever early on? Now, there may be some point for rebuke, yes. But a lot of people, when they have been mishandled, means they have been, uh, just some slang words are, hammered or uh, 
put down or uh, given the riot act, you know, just, I think you get the point. Listen before speaking. There's a, there's a proverb that talks about the foolishness of speaking before you, before you know the facts. I think that would go here. And then look for ways to portray God. You know, ooh, that's a big one. How do we do that? Uh, <clears throat> in some of the person's situation, as they've perhaps been hurt and they've, they've responded poorly and it's got them in this dead end, some of that dead end may be because they've gotten the wrong view of God. Because if, if they know God, it, and if this can happen to a, a good Christian person that who's, who's well-versed in the scriptures and the doctrines and know them well, but the, the, the theological God does not match the practical God that they, they're thinking they know and what they see. <clears throat> so as we are interacting with them, we're kind of given a, a, a scary responsibility of portraying God. What's he like? What's God like? Uh, in this book, Paul Tripp talks a lot about incarnating Christ in our relationship with that person. It's a big word that just means uh, your standing in the place of Jesus at this moment, talking to this person, because he is not his, here physically. And wouldn't we love for that, to only have Jesus as our counselor? That would be great, but we're stuck with each other in the meantime. So, it means to be God with skin by communicating. It means I care, I'm here with you. Uh, and it means being a living example of of God himself. Okay, well that gets back to your own relationship with God. How, how do I do this? How do you do this? If you don't, yourself don't have a good relationship with God or know him well, it's hard. Uh, so all the more reason to be clear about that and do your best. Uh, like Ben said, it's not a switch. It's a process. We're all in that process. So each of us are in the process of getting to know God, getting to be like him, uh, and then trying to help the next person that's maybe a few steps behind us and helping them come along as well. And, ha and gently help them see that God identifies with their suffering. Uh, he journeys with them and he's working for their good, but when they or we are in that dead end, we can't see that. We can't see that God's there. We forget that. We can see it in the scripture. We can read it in a book. We can be told it, but we forget it. And, it, and it, it's not real. So that's part of the tough job of helping that person remember that God is with them. And, and the, the hard part is it, it takes more than just words. Well, be, you know, it's going to be okay because God is with you. Huh, sorry, I'm not feeling that. I don't, I don't see that. Well, to just to be told that, that's nice, but that, your job's not done. Uh, it's got to go beyond that, and it may take a long time. So remember, we're just starting. We're just getting the start of this. And these are things to just keep in mind as we begin. <clears throat> and then, even in the first time together, be prepared for complications. We may have this ideal view that I'm going to sit down with this person and I, I, I think I can help them and that's great because that's what the person needs. They need someone with confidence that they can rely on, that you have some clue as to where you're going to go and you're going to take their hand and, and we're going to go there together. But a person can, can take that wrongly. And one thing that is, is an interesting point that was made here, I didn't think of this, but they can latch on to us in a suffocating way. Like, they start looking at us as the Savior. Okay, well, that doesn't feed, that doesn't do well for our own if we're having this Messiah complex inside of our own heart and they start feeding that. That makes for a bad relationship for, for helping either of them. We, we both go downhill. So, 
on one hand, be prepared in your own heart, don't go there. The other is be aware that you may be looked upon as that person. That, that that person is in such dire straits that they'll grab onto anything. It's like a lifeguard swimming out to, per, to, to help a drowning person. That drowning person, it's often taught in lifeguard classes that be careful when you get close to that person because they will grab onto you and like a life vest and you both go down. And that can happen in a counseling situation. So you deal with it a little differently, of course, because this is not physical. So it's important then to set boundaries as of meaning have an understanding, establish an understanding of how your relationship is going to go. What, how much time are you going to spend with that person? Now, if you give them your cell phone number and you say, call me anytime, 24-7, I'm here, be prepared. Uh, because if that person is natured that way and said, I'm, I'm going for this because I'm going down and I need some help, that can be detrimental to your ability to help them. And also, think about it. If you're married and, and you're trying to help someone, that can interfere with your own responsibilities to your spouse and your family. Uh, so it's okay to put boundaries on your helping of that person and establish times when it's okay to call, when it's not okay to call. And I would say it's not, you're, you're not hurting them, you're not betraying them. If they call outside of those times and say, I'm sorry, uh, uh, I would like you to call. I'm caring, I'm, I'm ready for you, but uh, this has been established. We Remember, we realized, we decided that you can call in these particular times. Now, I don't know, you make it a wisdom call then is if, if this is a dire emergency and, and it truly is an emergency, you're going to have to try to figure that out at the time. But, but this type of person will create emergencies and, and they're, some of them are good, pretty good at it. Okay, so it kind of gets into the next part. People will try to manipulate us. That's just kind of what they're doing. It's, it's innocently perhaps or maybe it's not innocent. Maybe that's part of their problem is, is, a, is a, a, a latch on uh, manipulative type of person. And you might be aware of how, how they're talking to you, how they're, how they're trying to get your attention. Like it says, uh, people trying to make you feel responsible for what you're not responsible for. If they try to make you responsible for how they feel and, and their progress, that's a clue. Something, something's not right here. You, you, you've got more work to do or, uh, worst case, terminate the, the, the relationship. But that's kind of a worst case scenario. <clears throat> Loving people means being clear about what's best for the other person in the long run. Because remember, I think in a church situation, a church, and that's the best situation, is likely it's going to be a long-term relationship. So you've got to make it so that it can be a long-term relationship and you won't die three weeks from now because the person is drowning you in, in their in their situation. Be aware of people who push and pull at the same time. Uh, it could be a response from pain, from uh, relationships in their past. Keep loving, keep helping them, but it always be discerning, be careful. <clears throat> and boundaries, like again, are, are important for, not only for establishing relationships, but and this point here is cross-gender counseling. I, I wouldn't stand here and say it's forbidden, but do so carefully. If you're married, you have an advantage because you, the wife has a husband, a husband has a wife, to be partners with this in this situation. Uh, I think it's pretty unwise for just one man to help one lady or one lady to help one man. Uh, should probably just stay away from that. But, okay, if, if, if you're approached and say, will you, will you help me, and it's the opposite gender, I think it's, it's loving to say, yes, but 
here's how we're going to do it. I'm not going to be able to, because of my situation, I, I can't really sit down with you a lot, but I can put you in touch with someone who can. And you can make sure that there is a good person that can go with them. And perhaps you can be an advisor, not in the, in the moment, but you can be a behind the scenes advisor for that situation. Maybe it's someone who has a heart for it, but is new at it, and they want to help, and they can. But So that would be a way for you to be involved in a cross-gender situation where you, a young lady helps a young lady, and you can be an advisor to that. It's just off the top of my head, that would be one way to do it. Uh, but it's not being uncaring to say no if it's a cross-gender and you have no way to, to pad that with, with uh, an additional person. So as you begin your relationship, it's, it's important to be clear on, on your relationship and, and the roles you're going to play in this. Uh, define what kind of relationship you want to establish. And it can vary. Uh, depending on the problem that, that they may have, you may want to establish a certain, certain amount of uh, repetitions, a certain amount of time, a certain amount of how frequent you want to get together. Uh, and roles mean having an understanding of maybe like who's calling the shots. Is it the, is it, is it the, is it the client or you, or is it your friend or you? Um, I remember when my, we were at, we went to a chiropractic office one time and, and we have to go there often, but uh, in the office, right in a waiting room, it says the likelihood of success of your visit depends on which one of us is the doctor. <laughs> and that was, <laughs> that said it pretty well, <laughs> because if you establish a role where you have an understanding that someone is going to guide the direction you're going, and if, you, if you're simply reacting to the things that they're presenting to you, then they're guiding where you're going, and how well can you lead if they're, if they're the one directing your, your uh, outcomes and what you're going to do and say? So, and also if, if you're going to take on this role, it's going, to re, it's going to be in your lap to initiate things along the way. Uh, again, if, if there's a, perhaps a fine line between reacting and guiding, and you do want to be responsive to the things that they are telling you and is bothering them, and, and you, want to, you want to be attentive to that. But it, it's, it's, it, it could be a little bit of a, um, a wisdom call as to how to actually uh, do that. So, and also as far as relationships and responsibilities, if they're coming to you for help, then it needs to be clear that you as the helper are going to help them, but you're going to give them things to do. You're going to give them things to think about. You're going to give them homework. And it's their responsibility to answer the questions you ask and to do the homework you give them. Because after all, it's for their sake. But it, it does occur sometimes where a person is really, really puts up a wall and doesn't want to do what you ask them to do. But they'll continue to say, I want help. But that, what that gets back to is they, want, they have in their mind a certain type of help that they want, and they want to make sure you're going to give them that help. But you, as in an independent mind and a separate, a separate set of eyes, <clears throat> you might be seeing a different thing going on. And often the person themselves with the problem, they see the world through their problem, through their, through their eyes, through their glasses, and it... <clears throat> They want that thing fixed. So they think that if, if such and such is fixed, then life will be great, and I want you to fix that problem. And often that could be a spouse. It could be a friend. That it's their problem. I have, I have this trouble because they are doing these things, and I want you to fix that person. So 
if they're truly open to being helped, they need to understand that. And that's where you can, in this first time around, establish that relationship, establish the responsibilities that each of you are going to take. You as the helper, you're going to make sure that you're on board, you're going to, you're involved, you're engaged, you're going to lead. And they, as the ones asking for help, they're committing themselves to do what's asked of them, even though it's hard. Because likely it's going to be hard in order to get out of the rut that they're in or the dead end they're in. It's going to take some doing some hard things. That can establish a good relationship. <clears throat> and then as you go on, apparently I, I would like to think that this is not your only meeting. You're, the only time you get together so if they may not have the ability to, to bring that up or to say that they, they want to go on, but they just know they need help and something's wrong. So try to feel them out. If they're gun shy, take that in consideration. Be gentle. Try, try approaching it in a way that may be a little more around the barn, so to speak. Uh, you could say, an example here is, how would it be if I check back with you in a week or so and see how things are going? So this is, a, this is an indication that they may have not really thought through how it's going to go if you're going to establish a, a long-term, lot of meeting type of relationship. So they, they may be hesitant. And again, this might be a person who got burned before and they're not, they don't know, I want to feel this out. And maybe this first time together, they're sensing, how are you speaking? How are you responding to them? What kind of sense of care are, they, are you giving to them that do they want to take the chance um, of being hurt again? Or do you sound like someone a little more trustworthy? So if you sense that, you could approach it this way. Say, uh, this has been good talking, and uh, what do you think? Um, would you like to think about it? Well, maybe if I check back in a couple weeks, and we can we can talk about it then. See how you feel. And then take care of of how you meet. Where do you meet? What what are good situations to meet in? Uh, and if you have a place, try to make it comfortable. Um, suggestion here is have a table. Uh, provides closeness. Now, I do know that some people don't like tables. Some people don't like sitting across a table from another person. It, it may be too intense. So sometimes, uh, like, like that. See, a situation, there's, there's an example of a, of a meeting place that's you're not facing each other and, you know, eyes are meeting. And this is a little more, this could be a little more comforting to, to someone who's a little tense. Uh, Maybe eventually you'll get to the point where you, you need to do homework and you want to have a table in the midst of you and you're, you can talk and share notes, but this could also be pretty good. And what I mean, I'm saying this, I didn't say what it is, it's these two chairs sitting, you know, kind of, they're not facing each other, kind of side by side, little table between. <clears throat> so, other practical things, maybe a box of tissues. Things can get teary, so have that handy. Bibles and notebooks, water bottles, gum or snacks or whatever, I don't know, whatever you, what your thing is. But some of those things can be to lower the pressure in a meeting. Even though the term meeting sounds official. And so if, you, if you're building a relationship, it may be nice to start on a casual basis. That's why a coffee shop can be kind of handy. And then be prepared to take notes. And I would, I would say it's okay to tell them or ask them perhaps if you're, depending on how you sense them, do you mind if I take notes of our conversation? Because if a person's been burned before by lack of confidentiality, they may not want any record of your meeting. So be sensitive to that and take mental notes and then as soon as you're done, you can go and start jotting down stuff. Uh, some people like to use pre-printed data gathering sheets. It's like a questionnaire in a certain setting that can be okay. Like it's kind of almost expected in a counseling situation, a counseling center. But if 
this is at church or this is, you know, a friend, a neighbor. Um, that made me too formal. So use your common sense. What would work? But you can get the information you need without a form in front of you. Uh, so just keep it in mind. And then it's probably good, too, to, to say, where do you want to go with these meetings? What do you want to do with them? Uh, and then with them, plan how you're going to approach. Now, this can maybe conflict with what I just said earlier. If, you know, in the previous slide, uh, be sensitive. You don't want to eat in a couple of weeks. So this is part of playing that together. Uh, if, if you sense that it's going to work and they're just eager to go, make sure you have an understanding of how you're going to plan this out. Uh, and then also to explain what confidentiality means. Now you could, again, uh, I think they could be a little concerned about where's the information that I'm going to give this person going to go? And it it, depending on the situation and abuses, abuse exists, it's real, it happens, and sometimes <clears throat> it gets started, a conversation gets started, and a person may drop a hint at something. So I think it's good to be clear, oh, both in your own mind and make it clear in the mind of the person you're helping, that if it looks like that's the subject that you're going to have to cover, be clear of what your limits of confidentiality are. I don't know where all of you stand on reporting to authorities. That's a different topic. Uh, we here try to obey the law as well as being sensitive <clears throat> to people's confidentiality and, and their, their beliefs. But their <clears throat> abuses that in a way, it's a clear subject, but it's touchy and what to do. So try to be clear with your person how you feel about it. <clears throat> and that may, that may end your relationship, depending on what you have to tell them. And how they think about, <clears throat> how they think about confidentiality. You can expect nervousness because <clears throat> you may be nervous too. If you're not too familiar with this person, it may take a little while to get comfortable. And uh, the reminder here is to depend on the Lord for in those times of nervousness. Remember your focus is hearing the other person loving them, getting to know what's going on inside of them, <clears throat> and rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. It takes the focus off yourself. There's a verse in 2 Thessalonians 5, I think it is. I should have looked it up. But he's, Paul is talking about basically adjusting how you, how you help people in different situations. Uh, <clears throat> comforting the brokenhearted, uh, rebuking, I, I can't remember it all, but uh, the idea was pay attention to where they're at. It keeps to, keeps to your focus off of yourself. And then good advice here, aim low at trying to reach certain goals. This is your first meeting. You're just starting. You've got a long way to go. You don't have to be worried about rushing in and trying to solve their problem, the first meeting, <clears throat> first time together. You, you're again trying to understand them, trying to get to know them. And uh, remind them often that you're here to understand, <clears throat> help me understand, feedback to them what they're saying. That's a continual thing. That's a, part of, a continual part of your first meeting and probably every meeting should be that way. If you don't understand what they're saying, if they say something, uh, ask them what they mean by it. And this is another thing. It's, it's, it takes a little work to develop a knack of not assuming you understand certain words. 
So if they say, well, that person said something and hurt me. Oh yeah, okay, we write that down, okay, they were hurt. What does that mean? What does hurt mean? What does it mean to them? It might mean something different to you. You can imagine your own situation, your own, how you would respond, how you would feel in that situation that they describe, but you may not understand what that means in their minds, in their hearts. The same, you might use the same word. So you could generate a lot of questions just simply off of a first statement by asking them to define for you what that means. And I hope they don't get tired of that because that's the key to understanding them and not assuming you know where they're coming from, what their situation is, because generally you're going to frame it in terms of what you know and what you've experienced. And you could be way off base. And so giving hope is always an important goal. Uh, in this meeting, first meeting, give hope. And it doesn't mean lecturing or preaching to them, but feedback a little bit that that they're not alone, that you know, maybe a little bit about what the gospel is about. Uh, try to remind them, but don't try to hammer it into them. They may say, yeah, 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 I've heard that before, but do your best. But I think an important thing to remind them of is that you're with them. You're with them in the long run. Uh, you're not giving up on them. You're here, I'm at your disposal to an extent with limits and boundaries, like we said. But that can give them hope that they're not alone. So we want to conclude your meeting and conclude it uh, with recapping what you've talked about, giving homework, and talk about future meetings, if needed. Recapping means to summarize. It's really good to summarize for them what you heard them say, where, where you went through all, your, all of your talk together, kind of just um, cap it off with a summary of what you think you heard and what you advised them. If you did give any, it should be very little. Uh, in other words, just to, okay, we, we went through this, we talked about this, I understood you said this. This looks like a pretty big situation. I can understand why you're, you know, feeling the way you are. Uh, any, any further thing you might want to add before we quit? Give them an opportunity to clarify anything. <clears throat> Another thing is, if you sense that there is going to be further meetings, give them some homework. First time, give them some homework. Something to do. Something to read, perhaps something to... Uh, it could come from the story you've learned of their, them so far. Perhaps they've, they, they melt down at a certain situation in their life, and so you can give them homework to, the next time this happens, if it happens between this and the next time we meet, write down when, where, what happened, what are you thinking, and so forth. Uh, so that, first of all, they can get the idea that you are engaged, you, you, you are taking this seriously, you are committing to go on with them, and you're giving your, both of you some, somewhere to go uh, when you get back together again. That, uh, and it also keeps them engaged in the process while you're not together. It keeps them thinking. And some of the, the homework could even be read, you know, read such and such a passage and and write down what it is when you read it and what did it mean to you. Even that would be, would it be helpful. Because every little bit of homework is, is more of them and their heart that you're getting back to the next meeting that, that you wouldn't normally get because you're not together. So don't just rely on your times together to keep this process going. That's the, one of the beauties of homework. Here's one final thing I did, it wasn't in my notes, but when you get back again together and the, how they did the homework and whether or not they did the homework will give you a clue as to where are they in their commitment to do what's asked of them. Where are they in, in being willing to do the hard work of 
exposing themselves. Even, I don't know what the homework is, but you know, it's gonna be probably kind of some light homework, but if they don't even do that, you can get a sense of how serious they are they, how serious are they of actually getting help and really to work with you in that. And then talk about your future meetings, if necessary, if that's where it's gonna go. Don't wait for them to call you up and ask. Even in the situation where you're not, you don't sense that they really wanna continue, remember the statement given to them was, is it all right if I call you in a couple weeks and see how you're doing? Don't wait for them to call you back. Initiate that yourself. And then, you know, set a date, time, place uh, for the next meeting. So to conclude this, remember your agenda, kind of like the objectives. Ben talked about the objectives. And your agenda is to seek and understand what God is up to in their life. To get to know them. <clears throat> It's good to remember what God's agenda is. Remember, God is the healer. God is the one who changes hearts, not you. You are a tool. You are, you are an instrument in the Redeemer's hands <clears throat> to work into that person's life and to work out of their life. And God's gonna, God wants to put things into them. He wants to take things out of them. You're the tool. So that gets back to how well connected are you to him in order for you to be a good tool in his hands in helping this next person. And remember your place. You are simply an ambassador. You are you're being used by him. You're not the savior. You can't change the heart and you can't change their behavior. Now I didn't get in much into that. Ben didn't really say that, but a lot of times we can get distracted by trying to change behavior. And we'll, we'll start going down that path of trying to engineer things that will help them avoid this particular bad behavior. In that, in that uh, diagram I showed you, I didn't mention it, I was going to, it shows on the left side of it, it says bad fruit, points to the heart. The heart needs to change. And when the heart changes out, come outside of it, comes good fruit. But if we get if we get our focus on the fruit and not the heart, we're going to re we're going to go a different path in how we help people because we're going to try to change the behavior. That's that's not our job. That's the fruit that comes out of a changed heart. Remember God's the one that changes the heart. He's using you to do that. So, I wish you well and you continue as you continue here. Uh, and I hope you, I hope what you hear, you can remember to put in the context of going home. Not this is you're not just learning what happens at a counseling home. You want to take this home to put it in practice at home. So God bless you.